So, you've seen some people on YouTube put crazy large batteries inside iPod and get insane hours of battery life, and you're thinking, hey, I want to try that on my iPod too. Well, it's pretty easy. You can get these battery kits from eBay for pretty cheap, and all you need to do is put them inside your iPod 5th, 6th, or 7th gen, and they'll just work. But, what if you got one of these? Yep, it's the iPod 4th generation. You see, the problem here is that the battery connectors are completely different between the generations, so these large batteries for the newer iPods won't fit the 4th gen, and they don't make large batteries to work with the older iPods. Well, what are you going to do then? Ask Siri for help? How do I put the big battery inside the iPod 4th generation? This is a terrible idea and your video sucks. I'm going to watch Apple Explains video on why the iPhone is called the iPhone now. Well, the good news is it can still be done. But a word of caution first. This video is not meant to be a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to do this, but more of a rough summary of how I managed to pull it off. If you've never modded an iPod before, then I suggest you start with something less dangerous, because this process is a little more, uh, involved than your usual flash mod. And if you haven't done this before, then you can easily destroy something. Or someone. For this video, we'll be working on the iPod Photo. Why not the monochrome iPod, you may ask? Well, I've already modded it, and that's how I know this works. So, here's the plan. In a normal iPod, you have this large mechanical hard drive taking up lots of space, while the battery is relatively small and tucked into this spot here. And what we want to do is the reverse. We want to shrink the storage so that it can fit where the battery currently lives, and that frees up space for a much larger battery. But in order to do that, we're going to have to flash mod this iPod. Right, let's get started. So I've put the iPod back together because I want to go through the steps on how to open it. And for this, you'll need an iSesimo opening pry tool. Now, I've seen some people open iPods using flathead screwdrivers. Don't do that because you might break it. You'll also need a good pair of tweezers, a T6 size Torx screwdriver, and one of these magnetic pickups. These are just useful for holding screws when you take them out. So make sure the iPod's turned off by holding down the play button and then engage the hold switch so it doesn't turn on while you're taking it apart. Take the pry tool and find a good starting spot. Usually I start from the side and go in and down. Now you want to pry upwards like this so that all the clips pop like that. And you can see now this side has become loose. So just lift and wiggle it. And eventually the other side will come off as well. Don't pull off the back case yet because there's still a cable connecting it to the front. See that? If you pull it like that, it will snap and you'll lose the whole switch and the headphone jack. So don't do that. Instead, use the tweezers, slide underneath the plug, and gently wiggle it until it pops off like this. And now the back case can come off. Before we work on the hard drive, we want to just unplug the battery. So this is the plug. And we want to just fit the tweezers beneath it and gently pull upwards, wiggling it. And it's now disconnected. So there's no more power running through the iPod and it's safe to work on it. And now to remove the hard drive, just pull up this tab and gently slide it out like this. And we're in. Before we move on to the next step, I just want to make sure that this SD card works, so we're going to have to format it in the PC first. So it should format it pretty quickly, and you can see here it's detected 128GB with 120GB of free space. And now we're ready to use it in the iFlash. The iFlash board is pretty straightforward to set up. All you need to do is put the microSD card into the SD adapter, and then put that into the SD slot here and I'll just connect it to where the hard drive used to be. You see this peg here, that should line up with this gap here. Just line it up and make sure it's connected firmly with all the pins. Then plug in the battery and hopefully this should now be ready to go. So I'm going to format this iPod using a Windows PC instead of a Mac and there's a good reason for this. If you format an iPod using a Mac, it'll only work on a Mac, but if you format it using a PC, it'll work on both Windows and Mac. 
So you can see here, it's entered disk mode. So that's the text of the storage media. And you can see now it's ready to format. Once the restore is complete, it'll ask you to plug into a power supply. So let's unplug this and connect it to Firewire. Okay, so it's rebooted. Now, at this point, we can't actually control the iPod because the whole switch is missing. We've unplugged it and the iPod defaults the whole switch being activated when it's not detected. So we just need to quickly connect it back in. And now we can just check in the settings. And you can see it's detected the full 120 gigabytes. Now that we've confirmed that the iFlash is working, we want to move on to the next step. Like we said before, we want to shrink the storage to fit inside where the battery currently is. And at this moment, the iFlash is way too large to fit. However, if you look on the back, you can see that all of the circuitry is actually only on this half of here. Whereas on here, it's just text and no circuitry. So, in theory, it should be safe to cut this right down the middle in half. And that's where the saw comes in. I'll be back. That wasn't painful at all. In addition to cutting the board, I've also had to cut off the end of the SD card slot cover, and that's just because there's not enough space to fit the whole thing in here. At the same time, this also means the full-size SD adapter won't work either, so we're going to have to use one of these. Normally you find these for the Raspberry Pi projects. So we just take the card out and pop it aside. Just to make sure the microSD card stays inside the adapter, I've wrapped some tape around it and attached some double-sided tape on the bottom. Now, we just need to make sure it goes all the way into the adapter. Once that's in, just press down firmly to make sure the double-sided tape attaches properly. Like so. Right, it's time to install the board. We begin first by removing this black tape near the ribbon cable of the hard drive. And next, there are these two securing tabs for the click wheel and the screen. We just need to flip them up with our fingers like so. And these cables are now free to disconnect. We're also going to remove the hard drive cable in the same way. And just pull it out. I should mention that the opening process is almost identical for both the color and the monochrome models, and the only difference is the number of screws. On the color one, we have five in these positions, whereas on the monochrome, there's an additional one here. With the T6 Torx screwdriver, we can remove these screws. With these screws removed, the board can now flip open like this. And if we pull gently upward, it will now disconnect and the screen can also come out. With the logic board removed, all we need to do now is remove the battery, and that's usually glued down pretty tightly. We're going to use a plastic spudget tool like this. Never use a metal tool, because you can either puncture the battery or cause a short, and both of those are pretty dangerous. Just slide the spudge like this and bend upwards. So this one came out pretty easily. If you do find any difficulty in removing these batteries, you can use a little bit of isopropyl alcohol and that should soften the glue. Now before we install the board, what I like to do is just put a layer of tape on the back of the click wheel. And the reason for this is because the holes on the connector for the iFlash board go all the way through. So when you connect the cable for the hard drive, it can actually poke through and come into contact with the metal backing of the click wheel, which can cause a short. To attach the iFlash board, all I've done is just put a layer of double-sided tape on the back. And when we put it in, we want to align this notch here with the bottom of this clip here. And we just put it there and press firmly. And now it's time to put it back together again. Before we do that though, you might want to just brush the screen a bit because dust might have gathered on the inside. This just keeps things clear. Before we attach the hard drive cable, one last thing we need to do is just trim this plastic peg on the side because it's too long and if we attach it like this, it's going to press against the back of the click wheel and the contacts won't connect properly. With the plastic peg trimmed, we can now reattach the hard drive cable. So 
So we just connect it by bending it back like this and aligning all the pins. Now with the cable, we want to just flatten it slightly, but we don't want to completely press down, otherwise we can snap the contacts and break it. Make sure there's just a slight curvature on the side of it here. And to secure it, we can now reuse the black tape from earlier. And that's the flash mod complete. Now the battery is where things start to get really interesting. We'll be using an LG G3 battery, which is 3000 mAh, or 11.4 watt hours if you want to be accurate. The LG G4 battery should also work because they're virtually identical and the only difference is the model number and the pinout, but that shouldn't matter because we won't be using these pins anyway. For this mod, not only do we need a new battery, we also need the old battery. Preferably one that's already bloated and not working because we'll be extracting parts from it and it won't be useful afterwards. The most straightforward problem is that the connectors on these two batteries are completely different, so they're not directly cross-compatible. However, that being said, lithium batteries are technically universal, and in order to understand what that means, we need to unwrap these first. Right, now that I've unwrapped both batteries, we can see the internal structures. And when I say that they're universal, what I mean is that they have the similar components. Both of them have one large lithium package here, which is where the chemical energy is stored. And then on top, we have something called the BMS, which stands for Battery Management System. This is a circuit board that controls how power goes in and out of the battery and prevents it from overcharging or overheating. It's different for different devices, but the lithium package is mostly the same. This means that if they run on the same voltage, which they do, theoretically you can just swap them over and they should work. The lithium package is always connected to the BMS through two terminals, the positive and negative. And before we do the mod, we need to figure out which one's which so we don't get them the wrong way round. For that, we need to use the multimeter. Using the two probes, we just need to touch one probe to one terminal and one to the other, and read the number. If the number is above zero, then the red terminal is positive and the black one is negative. But if the number is below zero, then it's the opposite. So we can see that this terminal here is positive and that one's negative. With the iPod battery, the terminal's on either side, here and here. If we probe them like this, we're now getting a negative number. That means this one is a negative terminal and this one is a positive. Now that we know which terminal goes where, it's time to remove the BMS board. The LG one's fairly easy. We just tilt this upwards and you can see the terminal come out. Using flush cutters, we can just quickly snip this side and you can see it's disconnected. And now for the other one, we just gently wiggle it out. And you can see it's disconnected from here as well and the board is now removed. On the iPod battery, the terminals are on the side, and sometimes we could just peel them off with our fingers like this. And like that, one terminal is free. Now, the board on the iPod battery is very fragile. It can flex very easily, and if you bend it too far, you'll hear a click and that's it. One of the components on here will probably snap and the whole board will stop working. So be careful and don't do that. Now let's move on to the next terminal. One useful trick I'd like to use is to slide a plastic pry tool underneath the board here and then gently slide it upwards. That way it doesn't bend the board too much and it can remove the adhesive underneath it, freeing the board itself. Now that the board is free, we can peel off the other terminal. And now the iPod board is free. Now before I attach the new BMS board, I just want to make sure that the entire surface of the battery is covered in tape. The reason is because some batteries use the outer layer as a terminal, and because it's conductive, it can cool shorts with anything it touches, and we don't want that inside the iPod casing or during the assembly of the battery. Right, before we begin, we just want to make sure we have the right terminals in the right places. So, positive, negative. Positive, and negative. With the BMS board attached, all I need to do now is to test if the battery is working properly. And if everything's connected, we should be getting steady voltage. Good, so that means the battery is now fully working. Time to reassemble. Now, I've wrapped the BMS board in tape and just made sure there's nothing exposed, because we don't want any of the terminals touching the metal casing and causing a short. I've also attached double-sided tape on the back so that we can attach it to the back of the case. 
That way the battery doesn't rattle around when the iPod's moving. We just want to position it as high up as possible, right up against the headphone jack there. That way when we reassemble it, it doesn't clash with this bit here. And now we connect the two halves together and everything should work. When you are reassembling the iPod, make sure that the cables for the battery are clear of the clips and they're not caught between the clips and the outside. If they are, they can become stripped and cause a short. And that's it. Moments of truth. And here we go. We now have a fully working iPod fourth generation with 128 gigabytes of fast storage and an 11.5 watt hour battery. Brilliant. Okay, so one last test I want to do is I've put an album of 20 random tracks and I just want to test them by giving a quick shuffle. Well, you just witnessed me get rickrolled by my own iPod. And on that bombshell, it's time to end the video. I'll be doing a full battery rundown test, so be sure to check that out when it's finished. And before I go, I just want to say a big thank you to everyone in the r slash iPod Discord server for their time and kind feedback when making this video. I hope you enjoyed watching this as much as I enjoyed building the iPod, and I'll see you next time.